guess I'm making a video because I'm just really tired of seeing pictures of the Bering Land Bridge. Let me show you what I mean. Remember this picture? You see that? Don't you get tired of... So for a long time, I'm, I'm getting old, and I remember when I was younger, they had this arrow, the one that went down through the non-existent but theoretically wonderful ice channel. I guess I'm doing criticizing the Bering Lands Bridge story right now. They've recently, this is a National Graphic picture, they've recently added some arrows uh, for the West Coast um, seafaring route. And they've also got a little one coming in here from, I don't know where that would be, uh, China maybe, or Russia, or something coming up from the South. And don't you get tired of this idea that archaeology has always got the answer? You, you ask the question, they're going to give you the answer. I, you want to know who are the first Americans? They're going to give you the answer. Um, you know, how many of this or how many of that? They always seem to know the answer. The single site that they found is going to rewrite history. So let's let's step back from the, the madness that is American archaeology for a second. Talk about some of the ideas that have held us back, that people that had these ideas, supported these ideas, they've held other people back. Uh, the people who believed in the Laring, Bering Land Bridge or stuff like Clovis first, they did their damage and they don't seem to have been held to any account in any way. Um, what can you say? What you can say is, is that the problems that brought us to these false myths are still there in the way that academic archaeology functions and that uh, we're moving into a new phase of archaeology where the Western archaeologists have separated a little bit from the Eastern archaeologists, Western U.S. archaeologists and Eastern U.S. archaeologists. And in the West, they've broken from the Clovis model reasonably well because, uh, you know, it's sort of a competition. And it turns out the Clovis doesn't come from the West and the West has got its own wonderful Paleo-Indian tradition. So they are more logically able to separate in their minds the west from the east but let me just pause for a second and think about what i want to say <laughs> it's taking longer than it should so i think we should look at these myths and we should look at how they came about and we should look at why they're held so dearly because it's clear that American academic archaeology is still dominated by who has money to do what. And the money doesn't come from the public. Um, it comes from places where if the guy who owns the money doesn't like what you're saying, then you don't get the money. And so you don't exist. I was going to say that the, the Western archaeologists have been integrating their research with Native American thinking for much longer than Eastern archaeologists, the Eastern seaboard archaeologists have only recently needed to understand Native American points of view in the interpretation of uh, a new type of archaeology called ceremonial stone landscape archaeology. They discovered that Native Americans built stone structures in the woods that are still there. But just as the academic archaeological conventional wisdom dominated and still dominates the theoretical framework for archaeology, we're now shifting into another framework of archaeology that incorporates Native American uh, points of view. And we have this unerring desire for a single simple answer and a single simple authority that's going to just tell us what's right, tell us what's wrong. And the academic archaeologists, if they're being replaced by Native Americans, have to not be considered the only answer. I have my own thoughts about the diversity of peoples that have reached America, and we'll talk about the first Americans. And I have my own thoughts about how archaeology um, is under the wrong business model of an academic framing, and that, it, that there's a different model for how archaeology could be done that's more respectful, I hope, of the Native American point of view, but is also more respectful of the non-academic avocation archaeologist. I want to say that I think everyone owns the past, especially the forgotten past. 
We all want to see it understood, preserved, uh, integrated with modern life. And there's enough there for everybody. But I, I think I don't think it was good for academic archaeologists to say, we own the subject, the rest of you don't get to think about it. I don't think it was right of them to ruin careers. And to, also, it wouldn't be right if the same kind of social monopolization uh, went forward under anyone else's um, control or you know, control freak kind of thinking. So, I mean, it's a big country. It's a big, beautiful country. And uh, I think the only picture we should be looking at is this one. And that, that shows you how, I mean, let's, let's go ahead and start talking about the first Americans. And the first Americans is a nonsensical idea that somehow you would ever know that this person arrived here at this time of this species, this variety of, of human coming from this place. Uh, I mean, suppose, for example, that a few people blew across from here lived for five, six years or so, and then died. Would those be the first Americans? Or suppose that some people came and stayed that way, and some other people came this way and stayed. And this person arrived at 3.55 a.m., and this one, uh, 3, uh, 4 a.m. And so this is the first American. We don't care about that first American. I mean, you want to say, what kind of competition are you encouraging with that idea? the first American. What other aspects of that story don't make any sense? Hold on. Um, well, it's an, another example of this drive towards having a simple-minded answer. Uh, I mean, come on, the only arrows that anybody should be drawing about archaeology related to America is the one that you're seeing. This is the diagram you're looking at right here. Uh, so, I do personally believe that hominids came from Africa. I do personally believe that once that, I think they were saying that the hobbits over here in um, on the island of Flores had Australopithecine features. I don't know if that's true. Um, I mean, after all, their Neanderthal that they took from Europe was a crippled old man. So you can't necessarily judge things too quickly from single examples, which is another part of the critique of archaeology is this desire to say, oh, this single site is going to rewrite human history. So archaeologists were astounded. They were stunned. You imagine a bunch of archaeologists lying on their backs and sort of like, oh, what happened? Oh, just be careful when you remove that face mask from the Egyptian mummy. So uh, there's this desire for everything to be simple, everything to be single. And uh, let's look at what's most likely. Most likely some people did float across one time or another, unclear whether they would have survived. I remember a quote, I think, from George Carter to the effect that he couldn't understand archaeologists who knew that there was the bottle gourd, which is a, an equatorial African vegetable, um, was present in prehistoric America, but that archaeologists were more willing to believe that the bottle gourd floated over on its own. That it then that it floated over on a raft with people who were using it or, or knew how to use it. And uh, so, you know, likely some people blew across this way at what stage of evolution? Certainly, we know that Homo erectus got around. He got over to here, he got down over into uh, Sumatra. And I, I think it's very unlikely that Homo erectus didn't get to America. I think it's uh, I think this is a very likely entry point right here. Uh, there's a lot of places from down there all the way up to about here where you, you put a log in the water. And so the idea that, you know, man had to walk across the Bering Land Bridge, you, you, you can't imagine that that was a theory that came from a, a, a person who knew anything about boats or sailing. I'm sitting here in, in New England right about here, and I'm not a very... Uh, adequate mariner but i can tell you that in a pinch i could take my rowboat any, anywhere in the world and uh maybe i'd survive 
And it's not, it wouldn't take me too long either. As long as I'm following these currents, as long as I'm going with the wind. Would you stay near land? Probably not. If you haven't read Thor Heyerdahl's journey, which I think went from here over to Polynesia, proving that, uh, you know, the sweet potatoes that you see in Polynesia could have come over pretty easily during prehistory, uh, then you should watch that movie. That's a good movie. So I was going to go through some myths of American archaeology. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and go take a look at my notes. And my notes, which you probably can't see because I'm not sharing the screen, um, they go like this. Uh, the first Americans. Let's talk about the first Americans. And well, I already told you why I thought that was a silly idea, um, because you'd never know. And what does it mean to be first? And what are you trying to compete with this point of entry, with that point of interest, entry? Um, and, you know, also, there's another thing that's sort of wrong about the concept of a first American, uh, which is that this drive for a single simple-minded answer gives us a drive for a single moment of migration, which is absurd, and it came from a single route in a single direction, okay, not very likely. And a single culture was the one that made it across. Uh, again, if there was a prolifery of entry points and times, it's more like a it's more like a spectrum than a culture. So thinking of it as a culture or thinking of it as a single gene pool or thinking of it as a single language, uh, which are subjects I'm gonna discuss in subsequent parts of this video, is just um it it's naive, it's simple-minded, and uh, it's driven by a desire for, I think, why do people have to have one good, one basic answer to some important question in archaeology? I'll tell you why. It's so that they can, you know, if it's an academic context, so that they can write grant proposals and get them funded and have a career, a life. And uh, otherwise, there shouldn't be a drive for a single, simple answer unless there's a religious a religious component to it or a political component to it. I would think that we want to understand the stories of the past. And some of them are kookier than others. And there are truer things and falser things. But driving for a single simple answer is not going to work in archaeology, for one thing. And so archaeology is not quite a science in that regard. It's a little bit of a humanity, and it needs its own definitions. I want to say a few things about the Bering Land Bridge. Um, you kind of wonder, why is it a theory in the first place? That, that idea that they had to come down from Africa. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm spacing out. Why is it a theory in the first place? Well, why is it so important that we know that they walked across? Let's let's get a little clear. Let's just challenge the people. By the way, I, I think it's important to point out that the, the Bering Land Bridge people, if they're still alive, they're not hanging their head in shame. There's a whole bunch of YouTubes up there about it. And uh, why aren't they being flagged as disinformation at this point? But you wonder, why did they have a Bering Land Bridge story like this in the first place? And... If I look inside, I think the answer is just like, well, because the only way they could have gotten here was walking. And um, even though mice, camels, um, elephants walked across previously, uh, that was way too early for man to have gotten to America. And so one, man couldn't have come all that early. It couldn't be that early. And two, he had to walk. These might be considered sort of uh, Eurocentric, slightly racist ideas. Why? Because, um, well, why do you mean he couldn't have been earlier? Well, we don't know that. That's the whole question. When did man get here? To, to start off saying, well, he couldn't have arrived when most of the other creatures that arrived in America arrived here. Uh, so we need some justification for excluding the hominid species that were all over the place at the same at those times and the idea that he had to walk 
it's kind of a denigrating thing. I mean, America, uh, poo, 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 poo. Remember, the people who define these ideas were European. So I don't know, the Bering Land Bridge. I had some other, some other problems with the Bering Land Bridge. Hold on. Um, well, you want to make fun of people who don't know how to sail. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is you want to say, how come you got to destroy careers, but that was the end of it? Um, they wrote their books. They made their, they made their play. And now their ideas are being forgotten. Uh, but there's still plenty of people on YouTube who have not read enough yet to understand the things. For example, for reference, they found footprints in New Mexico that are well dated to 18,000 years ago. They found that the ice free corridor was no such thing. Um, they found that there's little evidence of Siberian diversity in America. And the only signs of American diversity in Siberia are a small number of Clovis points that have been found just around the, the edges, you know, at the very top right hand corner of Asia. The, well, we'll get to genetics later, but uh, the Bering Land Bridge also supposes that the travel was from, you know, China and Russia direction over to America. It was that uh, west to east, um, an assumption that seems completely unjustified at this point. So uh, let's see, what else did I want to whine about? Mainly that uh, these single ideas are harmful. And uh, archaeology needs a better, a better framework where single ideas are discouraged, single solitaire. Otherwise, somebody's going to say, this is the idea. It's the only good idea. And, uh, it, I own the past anyway. So let's talk about Clovis first. Um, that's going to come next. And I have to pause because um, I was going to get some of those nice, beautiful arrowhead pictures. Those, Clovis points um, to show, but I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking to people who should understand the basics of carbon-14 dating, which we'll talk about also in a little while. I'm moving my screen around. Clovis first, you know the story. You know those beautiful arrowheads that are shaped like uh, that, that have a thinner channel that runs up both sides of of them in most cases. And I, I guess well, I'm not going to get into the diversity of Clovis points, but they're beautiful and they represent this concept of the great game hunter. So this is the myth of Clovis first. And there was the myth of the first Americans. There's the myth of the Bering land bridge. Let's talk about the myth of Clovis first, which was another theory that has absolutely dominated American thinking to the harm of any, any alternative thinking and to the harm of useful research that has been being done and could could have been done. So the Clovis first idea is, is that the, the people who made these beautiful spearheads uh, killed off the big game. They were great game hunters. It's a great story. They were the first Americans. They arrived via the Bering Land Bridge. Um, so the breakdown of the Bering Land Bridge story has contributed to the breakdown of the Clovis first story. But the Clovis first story was kind of silly uh, in the first place because you know, people did dig below Clovis. People did find stuff before Clovis. And anybody who said so got ostracized. And uh, it's, I think, in the case of the Clovis first theory, why did they have that theory is not, not hard to answer. It's a great story. And those arrowheads are beautiful. I, I have a broken one I gave to the Concord Museum. I have a miniature one that I, that I kept. Uh, I have a few later stage things that are not Clovis points. I, I would love to find a Clovis point, but be that as it may, it, it, it doesn't mean that they were the first Americans. The, it's a fun idea that they were the first Americans and it's taken a long time for anybody who dug deeper for their voice to be heard. But uh, eventually, maybe it was because the Bering Land Bridge story was starting to break down. The Clovis first story was starting to break down and then finding air footprints in New Mexico on the sand, um, and white sands in Mexico. Mexico. You should go watch videos about that if you haven't. Uh, that's pretty, 
pretty unequivocal. I, I take that to be legitimate research. So the Clovis first stuff is gone. Don't mention it again, except uh, to talk about this beautiful arrowhead and the people widespread coming from somewhere in the Carolinas, possibly a point of entry, which if we went back to the seas picture, we'd find whichever current it was leads to Virginia from somewhere. Uh, I'm kidding. I, I don't know where Clovis came from. The, the majority of Clovis uh, sites is, I guess, in um, something like North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, some nice videos about that. Um, but we were talking about Clovis first and the Clovis points. I'll tell you one of the things, problems I have with Clovis uh, fascination. This is that there are other head styles that are found with pretty widespread distribution. The Clovis points are found, I think, everywhere, except mostly not in the Great Basin, where they had a different kind of Paleo-Indian. But I think they're found on the California coast. And I think they're, I know they're found everywhere on the East Coast, east, east of the Great Basin. Uh, but there are other points, stemmed points, which they're discovering to be older than Clovis in uh, Oregon. Uh, stemmed points are found everywhere in America, and the varieties and the shape, they're subtle, but I, there may be a possibility of telling other <clears throat> you know, stories of, excuse me, <clears throat> other stories of widespread distribution that um, no one was particularly interested in looking into because these Clovis points are bigger and prettier, and um, they make a great story. Uh, but it's not, it's not a true story. It should be Clovis best is okay, but Clovis first, uh, I don't think so. Plus, I'm kind of a fan of these stemmed points. I found some great ones in Rhode Island because a friend of mine showed me where to look. So that's what I was going to say about Clovis first. And now I'm going to talk about um, this whole tendency in archaeology is this, so the Clovis first was a myth. Uh, there's a tendency in archaeology to consider um, single data points as being definitive answers to something. They, the, the urge for simple-mindedness, the urge to have an answer. Um, there's a number of places where uh, too much is importance is given to one thing. You know, it's joking about uh, archaeologists were stunned to discover that these people had buried their site deliberately. It's going to rewrite this site in Michigan is going to rewrite history. Of course, uh, other archaeologists will never accept a single data point. And in fact, they won't accept any number of data points uh, if it doesn't agree with their thinking. And I don't know if I'd be able to accept multiple thoughts at the same time. I, I do have my own opinions. So Perhaps it's to be forgiven, but uh, single sites, th that a single site is going to be definitive, I, I think you forget about that. Um, on the other hand, when you find something reasonable there, you should not um, say that in the most conservative analysis, this is what we're learning. Uh, let me just take a moment to say that the so-called facts of archaeology are never quite facts, and then uh, you want to believe them or not believe them. And uh, I guess you have a spectrum of possibilities, and it, it's wrong, methodologically wrong, to say there is a single answer, because that stops you from looking more. It stops other people from thinking about stuff. It, it, I could say, here is an answer. It, it satisfies my need for an answer, but this is what we found here at this single site, and I'd love to find something similar at another site that we believe it a little bit more than if it was a single data site point. And similarly, when you're excavating a site, and this is an important thing, you put a, a test hole down there and maybe you make a pit and you, you, maybe you do a great job and maybe you get everything that there is that's there and maybe that's cool, good work, nice job. But I, I wanna say that uh, there's places in Nevada where you can see um, lithic debris on the ground. And you can know that this was a place where people, native, early people were making stone tools. 
And you look at it and go, wait a second, I can understand that they'd be in that place, but that's kind of a kind of spread out pretty far. And gosh, just a look at it. And then you look at it some more, you realize, no, 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 that can't be right. There's way too much of that. That, that ought to be geology. And this is the idea that this one data point it came from a, a single moment in time, or you look through those moments in time down there. It's like these people, but their family before them, their family before them. So what's easy to overlook is... Um, how many people were there for how long how much garbage they left behind it's it's impossible to grasp i think if you knocked down every every house in new jersey and then flew over it you know say with a tornado you'd fly over you'd see nothing but smashed houses and you wouldn't be confused as to how is that much of the surface of the earth covered by smashed houses that would make sense because you know today that uh, for example new jersey or uh places in massachusetts also have so many houses that you can't see but a smidgen of the ground in between well it's hard to accept especially with people telling you that there was a single simple answer and told one people one time not too long ago it's very hard to believe that it was many different people lots and lots of different times all these different times and that the soil in nevada was composed of layers of human debris in places and that when the soil washed away and desertification took it off what was left was a, an imprint, not just of a single people or a single visit or a small band of hunters, but the overlapping of the entire history of that part of the landscape. And I think the most beautiful idea is the idea of the landscape as being the key and the people are there upon it. But the single excavation isn't going to show it to you. And the... Uh, the single, what else were we saying? The single site isn't going to show it to you. And unless you're in a place like Nevada where you can see the single site, you, you, you're very limited. And um, so now, now what? Well, I guess the point is, is that a lot of the discussion of single sites and single excavation misses the breadth of the site and misses the depth of time and the depth of the possible. I mean, you find good places, right, on land, in the landscape, and those are gonna be good places for everybody for the same reasons, resources, resource supply generally, and uh, I guess protection from the climate if you're in a harsh climate. Those are gonna be the same as, the, as long as the climate's the same, um, resources are the same. Water, flow of water, even in the dry places of Nevada, there's still water flowing in some places. Availability of lithic debris, lithic material, I'm sorry, good rock, uh, good places to hunt, places where the wind blows down a valley and you can wait at, one, at the downwind end and hope to trap something there. That's not just you. The wind didn't just start blowing west to east. It uh, has considered, for example, game movement, it's probably very similar, even if one time the game was camels and another time the game was uh, elk. But perhaps I'm wrong about that. Perhaps the move uphill, which uh, must have happened, or I don't know, perhaps it was different kind of hunting at different elevations. And that's another subject about which I don't know anything. Uh, but sites were occupied, good places were occupied for a long time. So now I'm going to talk about the, the myths of methodological purity, I guess. I'm just trying to frame this as a bit. I'm just talking about technologies, methodologies of archaeology that are, are good but they ain't perfect. And I think people may be accepting certain things for granted that they perhaps shouldn't. Uh, I mean, let's start with stratigraphy, the idea that soil builds up over time. People living at this time leave their stuff there and then stuff gets, soil gets built on top of it and the lower layers are old. That's a good idea. It establishes chronology and can be done with very few tools except to shovel a sieve and a pen and pen and paper 
Um, I think there are some misleading things in the study of stratigraphy. It's clear that certain types of rock can be misdated. Uh, it's clear that lava flows can get on top of things and then confuse the picture, especially, I don't know, I, there's some weird results that uh, stuff, Val Sakio, it's hard to understand, Val Sakio, I think that's how you say it, V-A-L-S-E-Q-U-I-L-L-O, where the lava flow on top of Salutrian style stone tools dated much, much older than Salutrian stone tools should be. And then a uh, fraud was postulated and maybe that's what was going on. But um, I don't think that the Salutrian stone tools were all that old. I think that the rock was the wrong age uh, and that's a different thing. But anyway, stratigraphy, and also you get a sense of well, could it ever been flipped on, flipped over somehow? What could have happened? In Nevada, for example, uh, stratigraphy may not be particularly valid because um, all the intervening soil layers have been washed away. Stuff just collapses to the same level, more or less. So things are next to each other that used to be above or below. And uh, that opportunity is lost. I, mean, I wanted to talk about carbon-14 dating for a second because uh, that's an interesting thing. That, that may be perfect, but I, I don't think so. I've heard a couple of things that were critical of carbon-14. So, for example, just to review carbon-14 very quickly, carbon's got like six protons making up the atoms weight. It weighs six. And uh, there's a bunch of carbon with the extra neutrons in there called carbon-14. And, and it gets to, to that state, I think, because up in the top of the atmosphere, it gets hit with cosmic rays or something. But it falls to Earth and gets absorbed into anything that's growing, living, and using carbon. And so a certain amount of carbon-14 gets into everything that's alive. Now, carbon-14 breaks down at a reliable rate, so you can basically know how, uh, that this is how much carbon-14 a, a creature starts off with, and this is how much it ended up with. And so this is how long it's been dead. That's great tool, but it assumes that the creature took in the same amount of carbon-14 during its life that any other creature would have taken in during a similar life at any point in time, which assumes that the carbon-14 in the atmosphere is a constant rainfall of carbon-14. And I think that's not true. I think there are periods of time when there was less cosmic radiation or less carbon-14 being produced. And so an individual would be absorbing fewer carbon-14 atoms than is supposed to have. And if you looked at the dating of their bones, they'd look a lot older than they should. And similarly, if they're living in a time when there was maybe more carbon-14 in the atmosphere, then it would be the other way around. They'd have uh, too much carbon-14 in their system, and they would be judged younger than they were. And this all can produce chronological reversal in the carbon-14 record. I don't know uh, to what extent going further back in time, the data becomes more likely to be affected by that. I do know that they looked at carbon-14 ratios in uh, tree ring data. And the tree ring data, you can really start from today and work back to at that year. This ring looked like they had a good rainfall that year. But looks like they had the same amount of carbon-14 as usual. Uh, so they, they, I think that they've got a calibrated curve for, cal for carbon-14, which, you know, as long as these wiggles aren't too big, will allow you to judge time in a linear fashion. And, and that's fine. Um, but also I've heard that carbon-14 breakdown is pretty much complete by 30,000 years ago. I heard the guy say 50,000 years ago recently so maybe they have better equipment than they did but the idea is, is that after you know a certain amount of time 30,000 years don't ask me what the carbon 14 dating is you can have to find something else those things are out of out of scope so carbon 14 is it, it's a myth that that's perfect and if somebody doesn't and it, interestingly the archaeologists who swear by carbon 14 you detect a sense that they're willing to abandon it if it creates a, a, a conclusion that doesn't fit some other theory. Bearing land bridge, it's a theory. Why was it ever considered evidence? There was none. 
anyway, um, carbon-14 is probably pretty useful, pretty good. Um, I suspect it's useful, perfectly useful back 20,000 years ago, a time which is of interest. Um, oh, well, fossils, the idea that I'm criticizing the technique of archaeology. Well, so why do we know that hominids came from Africa? It's because we found the fossils there. I don't think there's been any too many Australopithecine fossils found anywhere else. And the whole diversity of uh, the hominid lineages, they, they describe the tree of man, the, the strange hominids with big jaws that chew, uh, what were they called? Uh, I don't remember, it started with a Z. Uh, it's probably true. There's a great diversity of fossil hominids in Africa that we don't know of anywhere else. And so it's a reasonable, very reasonable to suspect that that's where hominids came from. But just because there are no fossils someplace does not mean something wasn't there. And I can tell you the East Coast of the U.S. is not a good fossil producing place, at least, um, well, I guess not in recent, I don't actually, I don't know anything about it. But today, uh, anything that dies, the bones all dissolve because of the acidity of our soil. That might not have been true in the past. So I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know that uh, it's a limited view and it doesn't give you the complete answer. It doesn't give you the, there is no one answer. And uh, we need to keep looking for fossils. It'd be great. I'd love to find a Neanderthal tooth in Nevada. Wouldn't that be cool? But I'm a kook. So uh, let's see what other technologies do I want to critique? Um, well, genetics. Yeah, genetics. Everybody's doing 24 and me to find out who they're related to. And I have to say that, you know, I was a mathematician one time and I took an interest in the question of um, sequence comparison. So instead of, well, so just for record, for reference, talk about comparing this person's genetics to that person's genetics, or this group of people's genetics to that group of people's genetics. Um, and I, I just want to say, just to start off, the math is hard. Math is way too hard. And they don't actually know the answer to the math. I had it written down here, so I think there's 92 strands of DNA in the human genome, that there's 33 billion base pairs. Okay, so no, I just, give me a second here, bear with me. Supposing you've got a sequence, we're not gonna do base pairs, we'll just do some simple ideas here, I, I think, because we got a sequence made of A's and B's, A, B, A, A, B, 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 A, B, A, B, A, B, A, A, B, A, B, B, like that, and you got two of them, and they have a start and an end, and they're lined up exactly the exact same sequence. That's kind of convincing. That's good. They're very similar. But supposing you um, have a, a difference. There's an A here, where there's a B here, or something like that, and it happens again over there. That's a difference. Uh, what about if it was only one A and one B that were different, but otherwise they're all the same? Go, oh, that's easy. Uh, it's, this is twice as far from this one is now further. Uh, you can just count the number of mismatches. Mm -hmm. What about if you've got the A and the B and they're flipped like that, they're adjacent? Does that really, you want to count that on the same scale? I'll tell you, nobody knows what is the correct way to compare two different sequences, unless it's calibrated to some other reality. But the, the other reality in the case of genetics is uh, the same information that went into calibrating the genetics in the first place. I, I'm probably not being clear, but if you want to look at the, the, the how often does a mutation happen, and you look at how many differences there are, and say, oh, that's how many mutations where it's like, time out. Those differences do not all accumulate at the same rate. Time out. Those differences don't all have the same significance. So, uh, if you want to tell me that this is simple math, or that the, these guys who are doing 24 and me are looking at 33 billion base pairs or even 92 strands of DNA, looking for big, long stretches where it's identical, then I'm saying, that's nonsense. They're applying some algorithm that a guy 
who stays up late programming decided would work. It does work reasonably well on short sequences. And I'll bet you anything that they let that algorithm just fly when it comes to a longer sequence. So I, I wouldn't trust it, not without a great deal more um, explanation for what's the math exactly. And I doubt that there is any. It's just too hard. And even with a supercomputer, you can't be comparing uh, all combinations of 33 billion things or even small, reasonable subsets of them. They'll find something useful to do. I don't doubt it. And the big strands of identical DNA seem meaningful or short ones even. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that genetics isn't perfectly valid. I'm just saying that when you compare some fragmentary DNA from the past and you're saying it's similar or not similar to this other uh, genetic DNA from the present or the past, and you're using this kind of information to say this people moved from this part of the world to that part of the world in a migration, then you're going to be questioned carefully as to how you know that. And uh, here's a principle. Uh, you can't use genetics comparing this to this and draw an arrow between them. And how many, how many genetics discussions do you see in archaeology about, well, oh, you know, the, the skeleton that we found in the underwater cave in Mexico had this genetics. Therefore, um, I'm, I'm losing the thread of it. But they're always saying, therefore, she came from via Taiwan. You know, came from Taiwan to America. And I go, no, maybe she went from America to Taiwan. You can't draw an arrow because of two similar or dissimilar genes. Now, if this gene is represented with a great deal of diversity here, and there's very little diversity there, that would be considered a legitimate reason to draw an arrow from this place to this place based on genetic information. But I, I think that this kind of uh, ratio of diversity of that thing that you're measuring genetically isn't isn't being considered. And so uh, you should forget about drawing arrows, even though it's tempting. It's tempting to say, we have the answer. This gene shows you that uh, Neanderthals went from Germany to Spain. Or no, it was from Spain to Germany. We may or may not be able to get some additional information from that. But again, it's just one answer, so be it. I'm sorry, I'm shaking the table here with my, my vehemence. What else have we got? Um, yeah, oh, finally, linguistic comparisons. Now, you, you will notice I've been, as I said, an old man. I've seen the stories change for maybe 50 years since I've been reading archaeology books. And I want to say, you know, I collect arrowheads and I had some role in discovering ceremonial stone landscape in England. So I, I'm a very engaged amateur with a background in, in mathematics. So I, I do get to think about these things. I don't know how they compare languages. It would be an interesting thing to learn. I, you know, there's grammatical structure, there's word borrowing, a lot of very interesting word shifts, and a lot of very interesting aspects to how to compare languages. And I don't know, I can say, first of all, cynically, snidely, that the dates at which they put when these language groups separated are calibrated to genetics, which is calibrated to the dirt archaeology, which is calibrated to the genetics, the dirt archaeology, which is calibrated to someone's opinion somewhere about what is likely to have happened. Like now, a man could not have been here 50, 000, in America 50,000 years ago. So, um, the linguistic, the dating of linguistic comparisons is problematic, but I think it would be interesting to, to, to know more about. And uh, I guess if you're interested in language, uh, the only thoughts I have there are related to petroglyphs. So I got, I got nothing uh, other than these things don't give you the only answer because there is never one answer. And that uh, interpreting the data of the past, I don't believe it should be in the hands of any one group or any one idea. And I do think that sincere people should beware whenever they see uh, this is the answer uh, approach to a discussion. 
they should be aware that that's uh, looks like a dead end there. 